<laughs> okay, so we're going to begin. We are talking about uh, a very famous story in the Chomish. This week's Torah portion is called Korach. And Korach was a very learned, very holy person, but he ended up rebelling against Moshe. And he, he, um, he was a relative. And so I'll give you a basic short version of, you know, line of the story, and then we could go into some of the questions and the details, you know, that we have. So Kairach and his group, they protested against Moshe, who was the leader. And what were they protesting? They were protesting, they said, why is Aaron, who's Moshe's brother, becoming the Kohen? Why is he the one to get it? And he said, all of the Jewish people are holy. Shouldn't we all get this? Why is this being given to Aaron? Now, just to understand a little bit the family tree here, so you can know what's going on. Um, there's the 12 tribes, right? So we have Levi. Levi is one of the 12 tribes. He had a son named Kahas, second generation from the tribes. Third generation, Kahas had four sons. He had Amram, Yitzar, Hebron, and Uziel. And his son, his oldest son, Amram, had Moshe and Aaron. Okay, so that is, we have, <laughs> let's think of it this way. We have the, the forefathers, right? Abraham, first generation. Abraham, Yitzhak, second generation. Yaakov, third generation. And then Yaakov is the one, we call ourselves the children of Israel, B'nai Yisrael, because Yaakov's other name, Jacob's other name was Yisrael. So that's the 12 tribes, the famous 12 tribes. So that's where we're coming in. Aram is the first Jew. Now I'm starting off with the 12 tribes. From the 12 tribes, from Levi, who is one of Yaakov, Jacob's sons, he has a grandson, Amram. And... Amram has Moshe and Aaron, so you understand. Now, where does um, where does Korach fit in? Korach is a first cousin to Moshe. Why? Because, like we said, Levi had a son, Kahas. Kahas had four sons. Amram, who had Moshe and Aaron, but his second son was Yitzar, and Yitzar had three sons. And his oldest son was Korach. So Korach was saying, I'm also from the tribe of Levi. Levi is also my great-grandfather. Kahas is also my grandfather. I'm part of this royal family. So why are we giving two most respected positions to the same family? Amram... His two sons, Moshe, Moses, and Aaron, they are getting, Moshe is the leader of the Jewish people. That's the most respected position. And Aaron, he is the Kohen Gadol. He is the high priest. So they say, this isn't fair. Why don't you spread this a little bit? How come I can't get it? Why is, Moses was already picked, fine. But now you're going to go and you're going to make Aaron, you're going to make him get the next most, uh, you know, the next highest position. So he was, Korach thought, I was born into the family of Yitzhar. Yitzhar actually means oil, which is the idea of being anointed. We anoint the Kohen Gadol with oil. And he says, my grandfather must have foreseen that just as oil always floats to the surface, I, so too, my father, who's Yitzhar, who's oil, will produce superior children. And I am the oldest of Yitzhar, who's supposed to be oil and superior. I am the oldest of his sons. And so he's saying, I deserve it. First of all, 
my interest, my ancestry is Lostrius, right? My grandfather is Kahas. And um, so he's like, why am I getting this? And he says, he was one of the carriers of the urn. So he was already like a respected person. He was very, very learned, very, very intelligent. He knew Torah inside out. Oh, and geez. he foresaw in Ruach HaKadosh, in divine spirit, he saw that his descendants would be Shmuel, who was a known prophet. And in addition to all of this, of him having this great ancestry and being so smart, being so well-educated, he also, and seeing his lineage and feeling that he deserved it because their family didn't get something, he also was very self-assured and confident because he was very wealthy. And unfortunately, sometimes when people are wealthy, they feel like, hey, you know, I am, sometimes a rich man speaks with impudence, so we just say. So, um, and... So th these are the qualities. It's actually interesting because how did he become wealthy? Because the, the, the Leviites, all everyone from the tribe of Levi, they um, did not work as slaves in Egypt. And the, the way that all the Jews became wealthy in Egypt was actually because before they left, they had asked the Egyptians, they said, oh, could we please have whatever it was they had during the, well, let me backtrack for a second. During the plague of darkness, the Jews were able to see and the Egyptians weren't. So the Jewish people, Hashem told them, they were told, you go, while it's dark, you go scout out and see everything they have. So they knew when they were leaving, oh, this person had this beautiful bracelet, this person had this, you know, nice uh, wallet, whatever it was. And before they left, when they were about to leave and, and the Egyptians were like, just leave, just get out of here. We can't take it anymore. They said, oh, could we Could we have your bracelet? Could we have your necklace? Oh, could I have that uh, spoon of yours? And the Egyptians were so, you know, when you're at your last, you're just like, go, I don't care. Take anything, just leave. So that's what they were at. And they gave the Jews so much jewelry and so many possessions, so much wealth. So they all came out. But the, the, the Levites were not slaves in Mitzrayim. And um, at Kriyas Yamsuf, when the Egyptians later regretted letting the Jewish people go, and the Egyptians actually, they, they, they were, they regretted. They were like, why in the world do we let the Jewish people go? We left all our, now we don't have our slaves anymore. And they're very regretful. So, hi, Joan. So hi. they were very regretful. And they the Egyptians chased them. And when they chased them, we know that God made a tremendous miracle where the split, the sea split, the Jewish people went in the sea and it split for them. And afterwards, the Egyptians came chasing them because it was already split. So let's just follow the Jews. But God made it, turned it back into a regular sea and they all drowned. Well, they came with horses laden with jewels and a lot of different things. And the, the, the Jewish people took it. So the Jewish people were very wealthy from taking the, from asking the Egyptians before they left for, for, for different wealth and getting it. And then when by the splitting of the, of the Red Sea also, they got a lot of wealth, but the Levites refrained from taking this because they were very, they were more spiritual. They sat and learned. They didn't work throughout Egypt. So they weren't like so attached to materialistic things. And only Korah, who obviously was a little money hungry, he was the treasurer of King Pharaoh. And um, he, some of the Midrashim explained that he hoped that the Jews would remain in Egypt after the redemption, and he would then become the owner to the royal treasure. Like, let's just get rid of the Egyptians, and then we could still have Egypt, and we could have all their wealth. But um, Hashem 
leads each person in life along the path he wishes to be led. And so he satisfied Korach's craving for money and he let him discover a part of the treasure that Joseph concealed in the royal coffers. So he became one of the wealthiest people he ever lived, which is also a lesson to us that Korach started this rebellion against Moshe. That's what this crux, the main part of this part is talking about. And so we see that a person could be very, very, very learned and a person could have very, very beautiful lineage and they could fall. And ego really leads a person to fall. And um, so that, that is really the idea that wealth, a lot of times, of course, it could be used for tremendously great things. And there's a lot of wealthy people out there who are very righteous, but it's a very big test. If a person has wealth, a lot of times it gets to them and it really could cause a person, even with all his knowledge and with a lot of good things, it could cause him to really do a lot of bad. Um, and one of the main things that really caused him to run this rebellion so strong was his wife. And that is such an important lesson that the wife really sets the tone and the wife really encourages the husband what to be in. And his wife inflated his ego and repeatedly reassured him that he is on par with Moses and Aaron, but really Hashem chooses. And the only reason that Moshe was chosen to be the leader is because he was humble. Hashem saw how he cared for each sheep and ran after one little yeah. sheep that was in the corner. And when Hashem said to Moshe, you know what, Moshe? I want you to become the leader. You are the one appointed. He says, Mia Naichi, who am I? How could I do this? He ran away as far as he could from getting a position of royalty. And Hashem said, that's the exact reason why you deserve to be the leader. Because if it's all about me, you're not a good leader. It has to be all about the Jewish people. It has to be all about your followers. So to his misfortune, Korach listened to his wife and believe that he was on par with these people. And unfortunately, that really, um, you know, and we see actually the exact opposite because, um, because he, um, we see the exact opposite because there's another woman in this week's Torah portion who did the exact opposite, Own Ben Pelas. So basically in that situation, Korach gathered together 250 followers. He had a whole group that he, that he gathered together. And he, he basically, he was very convinced by Korach. Was like I said, he was learned, he was smart. He got a lot of people in on his, on his, on his uh, rebellion over here. And this woman convinced her, she tried to convince her husband not to be a part of it. She said, listen, Moshe is the leader. Hashem tells him what to do. He knows what to do. And you shouldn't be joining this. But he was too, like, involved. So what she did was she went to the doorway when they were coming to pick up her husband to go to meet with Moses and present their case. And she uncovered her hair because a Jewish woman's hair is supposed to be covered. And like I said, they were all learned, seemingly righteous people. But and they were all like observant and kept everything. But they just had this one issue that, you know, why is why are Moses and Aaron getting it? And um, she as soon as they saw their hair was uncovered, they couldn't enter the house because it wasn't modest and it wasn't proper to see a woman like that. So they continued on and she saved her husband. And at the end, we're going to see they were swallowed up by the earth and she literally saved her husband. So we see the power of a woman that a woman's encouragement could make a person or break a person or make them into this person or that person. So 
just to go back and explain a little bit more about, you know, Korach really feeling that he deserved it. So like we said, the Amram's family, as we said, remember, Amram is the grandson of Levi of the 12 tribes and the father of, of the, the father of Moshe and Aaron. So he said, Moshe and Aaron are getting to, this is not fair. And he said that um, he also felt that the Nasi, the leader of the tribe was then given to um, the youngest son, Uziel. It was given to Elisafan, who was the son. So he felt like we were just skipped over. In other words, he felt like why was I skipped over? As I said before, there's Amram, who's Moshe and Aaron's father. There's Yitzhar, who's Korok's father. And then the youngest son is Uziel. So he's like, why was I skipped? How come Elisafan was chosen to be the Nasi, the leader of the children of Kahas? And not me. So they went Moshe Aaron, two from one one person, Amram. They skipped me and went to the younger son, Uziel. Why did they leave? You know, they should have given me to be the leader of the, uh, you know. So why is Aaron being the, the the Kohen? And why did they skip over and then you know go to the youngest the youngest son? So he really, you know. So his first claim was. That why is Ara being chosen to be to get to be the Kohen? Um, he was saying it should go to the firstborns. Why is it going to him? And um, so that was that was that was you know one claim, and another, and that was his his personal claim. Then he had, that was, he had a different group. He had um, Dustin and Aviram, who were basically the, the troublemakers. And they kind of just like to join the group because wherever there's trouble, they, they jump in. When it came to the mana, they, God said, Moshe gave a message from Hashem that you can't leave it over. And they left it over. So, um so, you know, they would have just liked to see themselves proclaim the heads in place of motion. There was no basic claim for that. And then the third thing is that he won over a party of 250 men. Most of them came from the tribe of Reuven, who were neighbors to Korach, which Rashi explains is a very big lesson. It says, Ay Rasha, Ay Woe is to the evil person, woe is to his neighbor. People get influenced by their neighbors. So we always try to put ourselves in a place where we're surrounded by good people because we get influenced by people. That's just the way it works. So these were from Shevet Reuven. Reuven is the oldest of the 12 tribes. And originally the kahuna, the priesthood, was given to the tribe of Reuven because they were the oldest. But they lost it. Um, after the sin of the golden calf, it was transferred to the tribe of Levi because they didn't sin with the golden calf and everyone else did. So, you know, they were like, um, they wanted to, he convinced them. Why is Aaron getting it? You should get it. You were really the firstborn. So they joined, you know, because he convinced them in that way. So, Kairach, it starts off the first, you know, passage says, and Korach took, and what did he take? It doesn't, um, it says that he, he, um, that he couldn't, he took himself to be separate from the rest of the Jewish people. Like he took himself away. That's one explanation why it says he took, and also, it because that's when I finished the sentence, and it's also that he took the 250 men, meaning he convinced them. When you take somebody, you could, like you win them over, you convince them. So that's what he did, and he convinced these 250 men from the tribe of Reuben and Dustin Aviram, you know, who would, who would go along with him and... Uh, 
and you know fight fight against fight against uh, Moshe. So this um, okay. So this fight that took place it was right after the sin of the spies, which was in last week's Torah portion, that the spies, they, Moses, they were gonna go into the land of Israel and they said, we have to send spies to see how we should conquer the land. Hmm. Now, essentially, the sin, not to go into that because that was last week's Torah portion, we wanna stay on track here, but just to understand, because I'm referring to it, that the sin of the spies, God told, told Maisha, shlach lecha, to you, you could take it to your opinion, you know, who you wanna choose, if you wanna send them, what you wanna do. And he goes and he sends these people. And that's the normal thing. When you're about to conquer a land, you send people to see, let's scout out the land, the best strategy, of how to wage war, where we should go. Should we take this route? Should we do that? Essentially, their sin was that they um, they came back giving accurate information. People there are giants. The fruit there is huge. And they said, how are we going to be able to go? So essentially, their sin was that God they were only told to see how we could conquer, not if we could conquer. And they came back saying like, we don't know how we could do it. Your job was just to check out what was going on. Now, a deeper reason, you know, just to support why the people did not want to go into the land of Israel is because they were living in the desert where they got manna from heaven and they did not have to go to work and they did not have to, it was like an amazing thing, amazing setup, you know, that they had, that they did not have to go to work and not because they were lazy. But now they had all their time just to study Torah, just to learn. And they were much more spiritual. They had the spiritual man. They did not have to work the land. They did not have to worry about their clothes. It says their clothes were washed and ironed. So they had all the time to just learn Torah. And they didn't want to have to go into the land of Israel where they're going to have to work the land and not have as much time to study Torah. So anyway, so this story, this rebellion or fight that was going on between Korach and Korach and his whole group against Moshe and Aaron, this was after the sin of these spies. So there's obviously a connection between the two. In other words, why after the sin of the spies did this awaken Korach to have this dispute? So Moshe, Moses, he was the leader of all the Jewish people for a long time. Why is he suddenly waking up now? And also, right, he was fighting like Moses picked Aaron. What, what nerve do you have to do this? So he was go not only going against Aaron, but he was also going against Moshe that he, his leadership, he was, you know, doubting and saying was, you know, not okay. So this is the, um, so not Moses was leader before this. And the kahuna, the priesthood was also given to Aaron before this. So why didn't he come and complain and have all his claims and say why his claim was, why are you elevating yourself over the entire nation, we're all holy. Why are you guys only getting these positions? We're all holy. Why do you have to sing yourself out and you're the Kohen? We're all holy. Why can't we all be holy? 
So why is it coming here? So there's a connection that it comes right after the Egel, sorry, the story of the spies. This prompted it. Let's see the connection. Why? What were the spies claiming? As I just explained before, my preface to this was we need to disconnect from the world. We should remain in the desert in order that we could continue to learn Tyra undisturbed and we could be spiritual and we could just cling to Hashem without any disruption. But Maisha answered them and he said, no, you have a very good reason. You have a very good intention and you want to stay in the desert so you could just learn Tyra all day and you could connect to Hashem and you could serve Hashem without materialistic things getting in the way. But you're missing it. We're supposed to go to the land of Israel. That's our goal. We're supposed to work the land. Working land, spiritually land, is physicality, materialistic. We're supposed to work with the materialistic world. We're not supposed to just lock ourselves up and take ourselves away. That's what we're supposed to do. And he taught them action is the main thing. Specifically through action and through fulfilling mitzvahs in a practical, physical way, that's how you're reaching Hashem's goal. And he said there's a difference between learning Tyra, just studying scholarly, and doing physical mitzvahs. So there's the academic, there's the scholarly learning, and then there's the practical, physical mitzvahs, fulfilling Hashem's will. And he says, what's the difference? When a person learns Torah, it demands understanding. And not everyone understands exactly the same. I'm not on the same level as other people. They understand way more than me. And then there's people who don't know anything. And I know more than them. And yes, it has to do, you know, with effort. Certain people are involved more and therefore it's going to be different. And it's also some people are smarter and brighter and they have a bigger capacity in their brain. So each person learns according to his capability, according to his situation. And therefore, there's all differences. My Tyra learning is not going to be on the same level as another person's Tyra learning. And her Tyra learning is not going to be the same as hers. And his is not going to be the same as his. Everyone's is going to be different on a different level, according to their capabilities, according to their circumstances. But when it comes to mitzvahs, fulfilling mitzvahs, everybody fulfills it the same. It's the same action that's done. You could take the holiest rabbi and he puts tefillin on. It's the same as a simple person putting on tefillin. It's true that there are, there's something called kavana, which means intention. And one person could have more intention when he does the mitzvah, one person could have less. less. But the actual mitzvah is the same. The actual deed, if I light Shabbos candles and 50 other people are lighting Shabbos candles, the candle was lit. The mitzvah was done. The kavana, the intention that I add, that's different. It's like the end product is the same. The end product, I have this mitzvah. The godliness came down because of this mitzvah. Every time we do a mitzvah, godliness comes down, encompasses us. So I lit the Shabbos candle. The godliness came down. It encompassed me. And that was the same by all the different people. This one's smart. This one's learned. This one's not learned. This one. 50 candles are lit. They're all done. But the learning of the Tyra is different by everybody. It's not the same. Because learning Tyra's understanding. If my understanding is not the same, how can I do it the same as you? The action could be the same. So Kairach knew that Maisha was a very, very holy, 
elevated person. And he knew, in fact, even, even though he was a very learned and smart man, he knew that Moshe's, Moses's learning was on a higher level than the entire rest of the nation. And he knew that Moshe received the Torah directly from Hashem. And therefore, of course, his level and his understanding is going to be incomparably higher than everybody else. So he didn't find a reason to complain that Maisha was on a higher level than the other people. He understood. Obviously, Maisha is a giant in Tyra compared to everyone else. He went up to that mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and heard Tyra directly from Hashem. He didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. Maisha is considered half godly, half human. Of course, his Tyra knowledge is way greater. But after the sin of the spies, and Moshe told them the message was action is the main thing. Then he got up. He said, oh, if action is the main thing, then why do you deserve to be there? Your action is the same as my action. Your Torah study is way higher than mine. I know that. But her actions are the same. What is the advantage of Moses then? That's what he claimed. He said, why is Aaron being raised? What is going on over here? Why, if action is the main thing, then what right do you have to be elevated over us. So that that's what he said, just to quote the exact words over here. It starts off like I referred to before, and Korach, and it gives you, it tells you the son of Yitzar, the son of Kahas, the son of Levi. Why is it giving us all that background? Because that's the background of the story that he was part of this lineage and they skipped over his family and they gave three positions and none of them were to his family and two were from one specific family when there's four brothers. And so he starts explaining and they come and he explains that he has the 250 men and all the people and they go against, they, they, they rebelled against Moshe and Aaron and they said, Rav Lechem, you have so much. You already have so many positions. Kala Eda Kula Kedashim. The entire nation is holy. And why are you being elevated above? So that was his main claim. His main claim was, we're all holy. Why are you being elevated? And that's what he said. After Moshe, you taught us that action is the main thing. So then, What's your advantage? We're all holy. Everybody's equal when it comes to a mitzvah. Everybody could do the mitzvah. Comes to Torah. Comes to what we know, what we understand. We're all different. But you told us the main thing is action. So we all have the same mitzvahs to fulfill. So that's only after Moshe taught him that action is more important than entire learning, did he come and say, so then why do you get it? So what did Maisha answer? He answered, he said, Bokar Yoda es asher laiv es hakodesh hikri vevav. In the morning, you're going to know what the story is. Hashem is going to show you. And he, he gave them time until the morning. And then he was going to prove to them it was a stick. And if it's going to, you know, bud and grow and this miracle is going to happen, we're going to know that, you know, if that happens to Aaron's stick and not their stick, then we know that Aaron, you know, is the one who deserves it. Which maybe we'll have time to talk about, but probably not. So we'll leave that on the side. But the point that we're bringing out over here is what was his answer? Tomorrow you're going to know. Firstly, Maisha is giving an opportunity for them to repent, for them to return. 
tomorrow. Think about it. Maybe you'll put it all in place and you'll realize. So he gave them that chance. That's a real leader. Not, why are you going against me? What are you doing? I want to give you a chance to make up, to repent, to do tshuva. Why specifically until the morning? Maisha was hinting to Kairach and to his whole congregation, to all the people that he gathered with him, that fulfilling mitzvahs needs to be like Booker. Morning. What is morning? Light. Mitzvahs have to be lit up. Mitzvahs that bring to the knowledge of Hashem. Mitzvahs that bring godliness and light up the world. So he's saying it's possible to fulfill all the mitzvahs without any intent, without that light attached to it, without, without that. But then the mitzvahs will not be lit up like the morning. And that is the lesson to us. Fulfilling the mitzvahs, doing the actual deed, lighting the candle, visiting the person that's sick, being kind to another person, eating kosher, whatever it may be. That's the main thing. Don't suffice with learning and with good thoughts. You could think all day, all night about the holiness of the candle and the Shabbos. But if you didn't actually light the candle, you didn't do it. Of course, it's best to do both. Think about the holiness of Shabbos while you're lighting it. Think about what it means and what Shabbos means and you're bringing it in for sure. But that is like if you say, you know what? I just, I'm not going to cook supper. I'm just going to like tell you about all the fancy gourmet meals I was thinking about. And I'm going to just, it's talk about gourmet meals and give nothing is worse than give a simple meal and don't have all these, you know, big uh, fancy things going on, you know, in your brain. So we can't stop a good thought and just learning. We need to fulfill the mitzvahs in actuality. And with this, we need to, but he's telling them, even though mitzvahs are the main thing and action is the main thing, that is true. But I am still telling you, I'm still telling you that Boker V'yoda Hashem, in the morning you need to light up those mitzvahs. That's the first step. That's the main thing. But don't stop there. Light up those mitzvahs and that will bring to the knowledge of Hashem. And that would, you know, that, 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 that would be. And so every Jew, you know, could, could reach this level. And we do learn something very positive for Kairach. And I'll end off with this point. You know, there's a lot more. It's very interesting, which, you know, his claims and what we can learn from them, but we don't have time for that today. But the claim of Kairach was everybody's holy. And why are you elding against everyone else? And Hashem says a similar thing. He says, You should all be the entire nation for a, uh, you know, should be Kohanim, should be holy and royal. And it says, We're a holy nation. And he wanted to reach this very high level of being the Kohen Gadol. So it comes from a good place that he wanted to be a holy person. He wanted, in other words, his intention was good. And this teaches us that every one of us is really supposed to say, When will my deeds reach the deeds of Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov? We all need to strive to be similar and to reach the highest levels. And, and we should all have that desire and that yearning 
to become a kain, a high priest who's more spiritual, who could serve in the base of Egdash. So if this was all good, and he's teaching us a very important lesson, a very good lesson, a lesson of we should always strive to be the highest like our forefathers. So what was his sin? What was the problem? He didn't realize that in order to reach this highest level and to enjoy and bask in the Kedusha and the holiness of the high priest, you need to have one very important quality. It's called bitl, self-nullification, subservience, humility. And instead of having humility to the one who was chosen, to the Kohen, if he would have just connected to Aaron, to Aaron Akayin, to Aaron the priest, and he would have learned from him and been willing to receive from him, he would have reached that level of holiness. So he had this desire to reach holiness. He just expressed it and carried it out in the wrong way because he was all full of ego, me, I, I deserve this, I'm there, pa, 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 right? And that instead of saying, I want to reach that level, let me nullify myself. Let me be humble and learn from this person. And so instead of coming closer, so we have to all have that yearning to be very holy. But the way that we do that is from nullifying ourselves, not having an ego, but nullifying ourselves and say, let's learn. We want to be more righteous like those people. Let's learn from those people. Let's be humble. Let's be subservient to the great Torah scholars and learn from them and take from them and reach those higher heights. So in general, that's always a way. If you want Hashem, if you want to let Hashem into your life, what do you do? You make room for him. If you want to have holiness, that's what you do. You allow room. You move a little to the side and let Hashem come in. So with that, we'll end the class. Thank you all for joining, and I hope to see you next week. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for joining. Thank you.